coming. Uh, it means a lot to me to kind of support uh, the poetry, the Open Mic, the Poet Laureate program. I'm Tom Cannon. I'm the Poet Laureate of Oshkosh. I'm the first one. And thank you. And so my job is to foster creativity in Oshkosh, kind of promote literacy and things like that. And uh, so I'm really pleased that uh, we have this forum at Planet Perk. Um, and over this, yeah, yay, thank you, Planet Perk. So we'll get started. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about an event. Like over the summer, one of my events was to hold this workshop in Winnicani at this thing called the Museum of Writing Instruments. It's like this hidden little gem in Winnicani. It's very small. It just, these wonderful people um, run it. And they decided to have a, uh, a poetry workshop. And it was really good. I expected it to be great. Especially expected it to be really fun. But it was actually an amazing experience. And uh, there was a few seasoned citizens. And there's these two girls, one was, t their sisters, one was 10, the other one was middle school. And uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned through, especially those two, ch two girls' eyes, that creativity is not just fun, it uh, moves a person forward in understanding the world. I also learned that specific forms of poetry fosters creativity. Those rules really spur you on to uh, rise to the challenge. Um, and so we tried a three poem. That's a, a three poem is 10 lines. The first line is one syllable. The second line is two syllables and so on until you get to 10 lines. And I wish I had the poem of the little girl that wrote about going up to her cabin because it really showed how she had to use the specific word, the right choice to get the right syllable. And other times, she couldn't just say, we were on the beach. She had to use more syllables and say, and describe, get an exact image of the water and the sand meeting. And then she, went, she couldn't just talk about fishing. She had to create this image of fishing and the sun slowly rising up in the sky. For my poem, um, I kind of combined the two, two things. I combined the Ethry poem with the technique of repetition. You repeat a line, you repeat words and uh, for rhythm, and often it's to tell the, the reader that this is really important. I won't go that far with my poem. So I had, I had the poem, the line of repetition, and then on each line I, I added on another syllable. And uh, it ended up touching on something that was bothering me at work didn't hurt that uh, it kind of fit with my theme of a book I wrote, The Tower of Apathy. And some people over here are happy to know that there's a bonus, it rhymed. So here's that poem. You told me no. You told me to go. You told me that won't work. You told me you are a jerk. You told me I don't know what's wrong. You told me not to come on too strong. You told me, yes, you are part of our team. You told me, now, go stick your head in a stream. You told me you could be a value, you were a valued employee. You told me the new procedures don't talk to me. Uh, let me just do another quick poem, and then I'll hand it over uh, to Tom. And I just want to point out, it's kind of the neat thing is, um, the, uh, the Wisconsin Poet Laureate, Dasha Kelly Hamilton. She's the Milwaukee Poet Laureate and the Wisconsin Poet Laureate. She has a program, it's called Line Meant. And uh, it's like a poetry exchange. You take a line of poem, I have a poem, and then people write poems that are uh, connected to it. And so the prompt was, every distance seemed like an opening. Life begins today and stretches out like a stage whisper like a heavy fog. That is why now matters. There was a time long ago when visibility was infinite. Yet didn't we still white knuckle it? The horizon too far away was slow motion panic. Each day roads, more roads appeared. Each distance seemed like an opening at those ever looping intersections of fate. 
We could step off in any direction. We feared every direction was wrong, when every direction was right, if we had only known. So check out Dash Kelly Hamilton's uh, alignment. And now, t no further ado, Tom, you want to come up here? Death stands above me, whispering low. I know not what into my ear. Of his strange language, all I know is there is not a word of fear. <clears throat> First of all, drop dead, Dylan Thomas. It was a gentle night. I hated its soft, rotten, placid guts. Many guts is too strong. Make that a thin and shallow stomach lining. Anyways, I needed to rage. My light was dying. You guessed it. A lousy prognosis. Cloudy with a chance of early cardiac arrest. Thank you, Dr. Feelgood. I'll be sure to haunt your waiting room forever. Like I said, my bulb was flickering and was primed to be unscrewed. The bomb in my brain was crying to be set free to explode as overtly emotional bombs I want to do. Feeling unbearably I had to do something, I decided to go out. So out I went with rage, leading me, no whipping me in my raw, propulsive, omnidirectional wrath. With hands of ternodic fury, I tore up every flower bed I stomped through. Onto a warm graveyard, I toppled every insipid, blank-eyed stone angel that assailed me. On the same wavelength with the arm strength of a Kodiak grizzly, I hurled a brick precisely through each stained glass window that adorned the church, that notorious greeting ground of insipid, blank-eyed angels. My rage! Still unabated, I prepared to chop down a blossoming cherry tree. Yeah, I've heard that loveliest of trees or boreal applesauce before. Give me a high cliff, slippery, barren with wind gusts up to 40 miles per hour, a stark summit where I could bless and curse till my tongue dropped out. About to take my first whack, a summer sweat looking breeze randomly kissed my red forehead that then amazingly penetrated to the surly gates of my neglected and largely forgotten soul, there to work its wondrousness nest. I let loose the axe and went back inside, turned off the lights and went to sleep, happy as a scented candle pungently burning in the shadow valley of unpaid utility bills. The next is a climate change poem. Told that. I heard Old Man River was on his last legs. I went to the Muddy Banks rest home to check it out. I knocked and entered his brown, damp, and funky smelling room. The old man was in, what was left of him, which was a silty puddle in the soggy middle of a mattress of slate. A ripple responded to my visitation. Politely, I hoped, I asked, still rolling along? With a faint liquid but distinct voice, the old man answered, Sweat and strain, sir. Sweat and strain. Fixing the go, I again politely spoke. Hope you start flowing again when you get better, sir. Some agitated ripples appeared as the old man replied, Sir, if you think I'm bad off, Pay a call on the BP oil spill across the hall. Interested that the mighty puddle was talking, I set my cotton bale down, rested on it, decided to stay a stretch longer. This old bird I thought was going to tell me something I didn't know. I wasn't wrong. With the rhythmic splash of a spectral paddle wheel outside the muddy window, the old man began. First, you get a little drunk. The next is a evolutionary, uh, evolutionary fairy tale. Galapagos Park. 
The giant tortoises gradually gathered around a feeble and fading Charles Darwin. Aboard the HMS Beagle that was pierced and sunk by a horde of devout Norwells, a young adult Charles was swept ashore. After becoming a baby again, by his immersion in some oceanic elixir lightly concocted by Neptune, Lord of Magic and Sea Monkeys. Adopted eventually by the cold-blooded clan on the basis of his miraculous origin story, young Charles became thoroughly integrated in all things turtle. Epitomized that greedy time when Charles crawling on all fours would dig the deepest egg-ready holes in the hard pebbled sand. Now an old Charles Darwin's on the edge of his own eminent extinction spoke. Goodbye, my dear family. Do survive and thrive. Remember one step at a time and watch your back if you can. Then a casket of silence in case the great cast away forever. Ten minutes later, a tear dropped. From inside his hoary shell from which he never emerged, the group's spiritual leader commented, the naked one lived fast, died young, but involved a true turtle's heart. May he adapt well to the struggles of eternity. A strong breeze blew Darwin's white, wispy beard astray as one more ten-minute tear began its laborious descent. And I guess this is a a pandemic poem, I guess. Autobathon. It happened overnight, the traditional time slot for the fall of empires. The global alien flu, trending down, imperiously morphed into a subvariant mutation identified as Ornocron 25, a novel virus which proved to be catastrophically cuckoo. For the morning after Onocron's arrival, everybody woke up with the head of a bird. The media's talking beaks arbitrarily called it the Goonie Plague, in reference to the optical oddity of those who arose with the facial aspects of a Goonie bird. Unblinking historians with the poise of a brain about to nab a silvery streak of truth, officially named the pandemic the Great Barufflement. Concluding that unless science found a cure, the hybrid anomaly that was Omicron 25 would last indefinitely. The unblinking bottom line was, as always, mankind would have to deal with it, and as always, mankind dealt with it. The irresistible weight of the need for normalcy and business as usual prevailed as they must. Humans adopted a bird's eye view of all things, big or small, and faithful to their plumage, applied their many trades, professions, and lifestyles accordingly. Owls assumed the garb and guise of judges, accountants, and academics with a keen eye for rectitude, protocol, and mice. Hawks and eagles became cops, soldiers, and flight attendants. Flamingos and peacocks filled the worlds of showbiz. Parrots with rhetorical aplomb ministered the spears of old and new religions. Crows and vultures ably functioned as lawyers. Sanitation. Sanitation workers and speedy cash specialists, hummingbirds as brain surgeons, woodpecker, wood, woodpeckers as hard hats. But within the bird cage of the world, the majority of residents were plain sparrows, humble, hardworking, obedient, and anti ostentatious. Their only group excitement was to gather by bushes and fountains to twitter through the dying gleam of dusk. When true night fell, the essential business of existence commenced. The nightingales came out to sing, throated full with the brave ease of melodious immortality. Uh, my name is Ruth, and uh, one of the things that uh, about my life is that uh, when I was uh, uh, 15, 15 and a half, I went into foster care. Um, my father had passed away and my mother was chronically ill and um, uh, I got taken away and it was a really horrible experience remains to be one of the darkest times of my life still um, 
But um, I was placed at this home uh, with this couple named Barb and Leo Galicia. Some people, if you're from Oshkosh, you would recognize Leo's name. Uh, he ran Leo Speedway. Him and Barb were the fair managers for about 17 years. But a really neat couple. Um, uh, they fostered children for over 50 years. Um, what else do you need to know? Um, we're located out on Jackson Road near Highway 41. And um, I'm not sure what else you need to know for the setup. But um, yesterday, uh, uh, Barb ha Barb's funeral was yesterday. And I went to her uh, funeral service. And one of the things that we were asked is if anybody wanted to come up and say something. Um, believe it or not, I'm terrified of speaking in public. I was emotional at the time. And um, I really didn't have anything prepared although I had lots of thoughts. So anyways, this afternoon I was thinking about, I kind of regretted not speaking, um, but um, this is what I would have said if I had to share a story for Barb yesterday at her service. So I was a foster kid at the Galicias and I stayed with them for less than two years from about 15 until I was set, my 17th birthday when I was emancipated and I moved out on my own. Um, one of the uh, first things I noticed about Barb was she dressed in velvet and had really big hair. We were talking, this is 1981. Um, but the thing that I wanted to talk about, about Barb, at least right now, is that I was blown over by how much she got done in the morning before I even woke up. I would go to bed around 10 o'clock at night, and Barb would be in the kitchen talking to truckers on 41 on her CB radio. And she would be grading uh, papers. She was a school teacher. When my alarm would go off at 7 in the next morning, Barb would still be in the kitchen. Emptying the dishwasher. There would be loads of laundry drying on the clotheslines outside. Fresh donuts on the table. She'd have a meatloaf in the oven. And, um, and, then, and then she would remove her bathrobe. And she'd be fully dressed and ready to go to work. Um, she got more done before 7 a.m. than anybody I know, and it just, it was a superpower to me. Um, at that age, and for most of my life, I get up a half an hour before I have to leave the house. I basically shower and grab some toast and I'm out. For the first 25 minutes that I'm up, I'm in a coma. However, that started to change for me when I was about 42 or 45. Uh, suddenly I found myself getting up in an ungodly hour, and I also had clothes in the washer, and I would pull out a meatloaf out of the oven before I would go to work. I had discovered Barb's secret, what motivated her to get out of bed every morning. Back pain. Um, a couple years later, um, Barb did have back surgery. However, I'm, uh, I know for a fact that she still rose every morning before the sun, and uh, I love you very much, Barb. And I think that's the great thing about writing is because you can get your thoughts out and then when you're ready to share it, then you can share it. You share it on your own time, you know, even if it's 20 years later. Introduce Patrick McCorkle. Do not write. Oh, I can't guarantee that, Tom. I mean, Tom and I have had a very vibrant discourse over whether or not poetry should have rhyming or not. It's gotten contentious. Um, you know, there's been things thrown, but we've ultimately resolved that there's room for both of our art in this world. But my first piece is entitled, because for me, driving has always been kind of, a, I don't know, not something I particularly enjoy and I try to avoid doing. But when I was uh, um, inspired by a particular uh, roundabout that I went around to make this poem. So the title is simply Roundabouts, and here we go. So, when outside... You pick your lane. You yield. You slow down. When inside, you don't change lanes. You don't stop. Others yield to you. Otherwise, accidents happen. Such is order, regularity, consistency. Such is a roundabout. Youth. You pick your job. You yield to adults. You rush, waiting for it to be over. Maturity. You can change. Your job, your partner, your friends, others yield to you, others may not. Accidents may happen, either way. Such is life. 
How beautiful, how terrifying, how alive, a roundabout of a different kind. Thank you. And then my second poem is, uh, it's based on the library that the Oshkosh Writers Club meets at. Um, I'm from this area, so I've been to the library both as a child, as an adult, and it's titled simply, My Hometown Library. Before I had to study, before I had to work, before I had to mature, I remember calm lions staring. I remember a dome reaching for the sky. I remember pillars thick as tree trunks. I remember books stretching on forever. I remember this place beckoning, luring, enchanting from sunrise to sunset, during frost and chill, rain and bloom, sun and heat, wind and leaves. I remember the lights arranged, the book selected, the bench hosting, father and son, experiencing nights clashing blades, ships parting waters, wizards casting spells, spacecraft finding life, friendships strengthened, foes vanquished, language assembling, technology developing, culture forming, religion spreading, Civilization risen, civilization burned. Twenty years later, the silent carnivores, the sky-spearing dome, the thick, stocky pillars, the endless tomes, still beckon, still lure, still enchant, from dawn to dusk, through ice and snow crunching beneath my feet, flora and fauna blooming in the fields, Warmth and sand spreading beneath my toes, red and orange crinkling in the breeze. I will not forget the drafts constructed, the tabled arrayed, the writers presenting, essays, epics, fables, memoirs, novels, op-eds, poems, songs. I will not forget the structure that stays the same. I will not forget the building that inspired me to read and to write, I will not forget my hometown library. And this is, I wrote this, uh, it's part of a piece for Earth Day. Um, I suppose it would be a rough title is Sapiens Plunders um, for Earth Day of this year. Sapiens murders fauna, humble to grand. No one protests. Sapiens murders flora barren to lush. No one questions. Sapiens fractures rock, brittle to strong. No one travels. Sapiens pollutes water, droplets to waves. No one drinks. Sapiens taints air, thin to dense. No one breathes. When we cannot hunt, when we cannot farm, when we cannot travel, when we cannot drink, when we cannot breathe, we shall endure our supernova, sapiens shall cease. Before you stumble upon emerald earth bereft of trees, before you starve beside teal tributary bereft of fish, before you suffocate under cobalt canopy bereft of atmosphere, before you explode with the scarlet sun bereft of mercy, protect the world forms, flora, fauna, rock, air, water, storm, because they are you. They are me, as one we are, as one we belong. Otherwise, sapiens will cease to be. Thank you, Patrick. Jeffrey McAndrew, come on up. Thank you. Uh, my Heart at Ease, that was published uh, in uh, May of this year, so it's pr pretty brand new yet. And I did challenge myself to write 100 poems in the year 2021. And um, so uh, my wife thought I was a little nuts, but I, I, I did do that. Um, so I'm going to read just a few short poems, and they're, they're very short um, poems. I'd like to thank Tom, too, Tom Cannon, who did the forward for this. He was very gracious in uh, lending his time and wrote a beautiful forward to the book. So 
very honored to have the Oshkosh Poet Laureate do that. And Tom has also given me inspiration, given the community of North Fond du Lac inspiration, and that we are right now in the process of developing a Poet Laureate, um, which would be um, voted on by our library. So we're very excited about that. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay, I have so many poems to pick from here. This one is called Tilted by Prayer. Now tilted in prayer, humbled by the river. Awareness now shifts. I am shaken by a shiver. Mesmerized by nature and its powerful current, knowing the true essence, knowing what's urgent. I turn my head to the stars, and what do I see? A brilliant display, a wonderful tapestry. Moonlight reflects off the river's edge. I'm careful not to step off the ledge. Beauty reigns on this river tonight. As I pause to reflect on this wonderful sight, I talk to the sky and question the meaning. Is there a purpose and in someone intervening? Tilted by prayer. My next one is called Dancing with Emily Dickinson. If I met Emily Dickinson, I'd ask her to dance. I'd ask her a question. I would take a chance. I'd ask her how lovely the sky is today. I'd tell her to explain it in her own particular way. I would study the way she would prance about. I would marvel at the way she moved in and moved out. Total access to this gold-plated poet a treasure in front of me, not even knowing it. I might see myself in her eyes. I can't hold back. There is no disguise. Poetry is the future, and the future is bright. I might be wrong, but I'm probably right. Dancing with Emily Dickinson. Okay, this one is called The Sands of Time. Time running out, shout your last shout. Make it good this time. Make it scintillate and rhyme. Make it colorful, make it loud, make it epic, make it, make it proud. Take it up top, take it down low, take it where you want to go. The hourglass, clear warning, this is where our souls are soaring. Make it a great, make it great, make it your last stand. Standing proud, an honest and caring man. Sands of time. One last one. This is the uh, last poem of the book. It's a quick poem called Transition. Loved one, when you transition to the other side, on your love, can I still confide? You have broken through to the promised land where life and truth eternally stand. Trying to break away from my feelings tonight as I hold your love tighter than tight. Your ghost is close, I feel it near as we on earth continue to persevere. O oh, love of mine, separation is not kind, because earth and heaven cannot bind. But I feel you close in the summer breeze, and your love still sets my heart at ease. And I do have copies of my book called My Heart at Ease. Uh, they're eight bucks if anybody wants one. I've got extra copies tonight. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, so I wrote this after the whole Roe v. Wade decision came through, and I had a lot of very hard feelings, and it took, I, I didn't know what to do with those emotions, so I put it into poetry. Um, this piece is called Blind Corruption. The grass is greener on the agreeable side. Sh hold your tongue and shut your eyes. Bind, blind yourself to believe whatever pretty lies. The father figure of the people, do as you're told, or face unjust punishment at father's hand. We're simply a child, unable to defend themselves, forever at the mercy of father's hand. But father is loving, father is strong, father is merciful as compared to all others. But step out of line if you wish to be disowned. The grass is greener on the agreeable side, the shut mouths and closed eyes. The many people forever believing the many lies, the biggest being that one country holds infinite superiority over all others, when in reality, it truly is finite. Us against them, the enemy is dangerous. That's what everyone says without taking inventory of their own venomous decisions. 
Petty wars and closed doors led with sharpened knives and nuclear roars. The conventions that hold sim simple rules blatantly overlooked and misused. Covered by lies, <laughs> followed by an outpour of burned archives. Paid off generals, officials officially corrupted, riveted social hierarchy with the simple illusion of potential betterment. Ancient ideologies, Penem and Circenses. Long followed traditions of hypocrisy, always ruled by the absolute autocracy. Tyranny holds many forms, maybe not always in the body of restricted rights, but the autocracy gives only to take. A pretty illusion. Look at the sunset as they pull the trigger held to our necks. Ruled by the minority of the majority, the true majority and the true minorities always get the short straw. The people supposedly in power hold only an illusion forever discriminated against by the minority of the majority. When an old man tells a young woman that she must do this and that, and she can't disobey without chance of facing prosecution, this is when we, the sons and daughters, children of mind, question the authority. And with that come protests, with that we grow, out of the misguided ideals and ideas of our outdated, old, misogynistic government. The grass is greener on the agreeable side, the side with the shut mouths and closed eyes. But our ears can open to hear the truth, if only we wish to hear it. That maybe Father isn't merciful, that Father makes mistakes, that us as humans are created e equal. The enemy is not dangerous. This enemy may be a brother, a mother, a sister, a father. We are someone else's enemy too. The world, a world filled with false promises, this is our reality. That the grass is not greener on the agreeable side, it's astroturf we've been told and taught is the grass we've grown. But it's manufactured, it's fake. The grass is greenest when we awake. I do ever want to share a rhyming poem just to show Patrick that I can do it. I can't, I can't do it well. And I apologize because I rhymed locale with local. <laughs> but uh, I was on the podcast. It's called The Kosh by Timmer Smith. And it's a really great podcast. Timmer Smith's a great guy. And he talks about people with a connection to Oshkosh. And if, so if you have one, you can probably uh, get on the show. Or the Oshkosh, the Fox Valley. Yeah, Oshkosh has it all. A wedding venue and a bank and a mall. A neighborhood bar or two where you can throw back a few. Our, class, our city is working class, but it can dress up and be posh. And let's talk about this contrast on the podcast, The Kosh. Oshkosh has a storied past, so spin your yarn on Timber's podcast. Four and one on local, but it's Wisconsin, so it won't be local. Guests have a right to call out a villain to condemn. However, most don't. They focus on the, they don't focus on the zeros. They want to name one of Oshkosh's heroes. If your conversation muscles are limber, then invite yourself to talk with Timber. Have a conversation on the Kosh podcast. You'll be amazed how the hour will go fast. So I, so I, I actually have two more poems that it has to do with about maybe trying to bring together about just my thoughts on it. And the first one is the fork in the road. When my wife and I leave an event in separate cars, we diverge. She takes side streets. I utilize the lights. Which is faster? We never remember because we are home. We have come to a fork in the road like Yogi Berra. Let's take it. I have my way. You take yours. And actually, we already have. But remember, left or right, we have the same destination. Can we get there taking opposite roads? Perhaps not. However, we won't get anywhere pulled off past the shoulder, pointing fingers. Donkey or not, we are not sheep. We all want better for all. Maybe not everybody. And then uh, my final poem is one that I was moved to write. A couple years ago, uh, John Stewart was testifying in Congress for the first responders. And uh, I was very moved. Poem is, do we stand? Do we have enough times in our lives where we stand, 
with our hand on someone with mouth set firm so we don't cry. Have we enough times where we stand resolute for what we know to be good against what we know to be bad? We need times where we speak with halting voice. Those times, impossible words come to us. It's a matter of forming them, not backing away from the podium, from the office desk, from the kitchen table. We're at an open mic, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, one last pitch, and that is, uh, I do all, I have, we have a Facebook group, the Oshkosh Poet Laureate of Oshkosh, where you can come and just, people can post poems or just talk about poetry or whatever they want. Uh,